this is entitled don't make these five mistakes on your first aquatic sensor because five seemed like a good number uh <laughs> i made a ton of mistakes and uh some were way more egregious than others some were i guess oversights not necessarily mistakes so i just kind of lumped it all together and made a snazzy title uh, i'm zachary fields uh, so who am i uh well I'm Z Fields on GitHub and LinkedIn. You're welcome to connect. I would love that. I'm originally a self-taught programmer, so I come from humble beginnings. I, I got a finance degree out of college the first time, and then I went to work for a bank software company. I found a how to program book sitting on the shelf. I learned RPG. It's an archaic uh, IBM mainframe language called Report Program Generator. But I discovered my passion for programming. So I ended up going back to school and getting a degree in computer science from school. I was then recruited by Microsoft. Uh, and I've got a long history in IoT because at Microsoft, I was a founding member of Windows IoT. And then from there, I moved into Azure IoT. And then I left Seattle and then ended up at Particle. And Particle's an IoT company. They make a couple of neat boards like the Boron, Argon, and Xenon. I think Xeon's dead, so Boron and Argon. Um, and their mission was to be the operating system for IoT, a super neat mission, fun project to work on. But now I work at Blues, and our mission, I like a little bit better than Particles, and that's to enable IoT on every device or for every device. So what Blues does is they created like the note card. The note card works as a data pump, so you just give it a JSON command and it magically is on the cloud. You don't have to mess with any of the AT commands, so it makes it a lot easier, and that's that's where I'm at now. Uh, I'm an open source contributor and maintainer. I am a maintainer of the Formata project, which is one of the original Arduino libraries that shows up in the Arduino IDE, and also remote wiring, which is one of my own projects that I developed while I was at Microsoft. Uh, and, th th and today we're here to talk about like, my first aquatic sensor, which I call the Waterborne Environmental Testing Box or Wet Box. Um, I did this as an Earth Day project uh, to monitor my local stream or watershed. Um, the, I'm target I've targeted this talk at people who are somewhere along the build path or, or in the concept phase of making their own aquatic sensor. And the, the idea is to share what I've learned so people don't hit the same mistakes or they can look out for sharp edges that I kind of uncovered when I was doing this. And the goal, I mean, is just to help people think about the things that they haven't really thought of yet. So um, this, is, this is the uh, driving force right here. This is Flat Creek, Missouri. This is right off the family farm. It's not just a pretty picture. Uh, I have got like a ton of the memories of my childhood from here, from catching crawdads to swimming, fishing, family picnics. And like, this is something I wanna protect, conserve and share with my kids someday. So uh, it, it was really important to me to take the, like to use Earth Day as an excuse to start monitoring the stream quality because this stream runs through town and runs right past the city's municipal waste treatment facility before it enters my family farm. So, you know, it it could have some questionable water quality content. Uh, and so I decided that it was time to figure out what exactly is happening. So here I put together like a bird's eye view map of what the, the city, uh, well, the waste treatment pond, where it sits. My Flat Creek is the blue line that runs alongside the big green spot that's the, you know, the muck pond. And the red dots are where I had intended to put my wet boxes. I was only able to get one out because I was still waiting on parts for the second one. And so where the one that I placed was right at the center of the screen red dot, which is at the the tail end of the waste treatment as it's running on into the lake. So this is gonna be right after the spillover and everything so I could catch every ounce of pollution that this may or may not be creating. That was the, the idea. 
Uh, all right. So I was just talking a little bit earlier. If you were in here, if you've just joined, this was what I came up with. It's a variety of sensors. I've got dissolved oxygen, uh, oxygen reduction potential, pH, turbidity, total dissolved solids, and temperature. Uh, most of these were provided by Atlas Scientific. You'll see their name right there on those uh, circuit boards. Uh, it's solar powered and it's driven by an ESP32. Uh, let's see what else. And then I used my company, Blues Wireless's uh, note card to get the data out of the box and send it on into the cloud. So this is just kind of the configuration. Uh, I was explaining earlier that the, like we talked a little bit about the sensors and this is another time to take a break and to make sure that everybody knows it's totally okay to interrupt if you see something that you're curious about because the whole point of this talk is to help you guys build. So, uh, I have one. Jump in, yeah. Uh, so that blues card uses like uh, LoRaWAN or something to send data? No, it actually uses cellular. So okay. the cellular that comes with it, it's 500 megabytes of a prepaid plan that comes with the card. So you don't really end up paying for any cellular transaction fees or having to set up an account or any of that stuff. You just okay. take the card, plug it in, it runs off of serial or I2C, and you send it JSON, and then the, like magically the JSON appears on the cloud side. That's it. Okay, cool. Yeah, so it, like I said, that, that's the big green PCB you see sitting on that lid is the cellular antenna, GPS antenna, and the note card is the size of a postage stamp, but it's tucked right in the middle of the bigger green board. Oh, okay. Yeah. What, what's the bigger what's the bigger green board called? It's called the note carrier. So we've got oh, a, note carrier. Card, okay. a note carrier. Okay. The note carrier is kind of your pin breaker because the note card has an N2 connector itself. So the that's a little bit hard to work with, obviously. So these note carriers are pretty important because they let you have the pins with either on a castellated edge or so that you can put jumper wires to it, which is what I've done here. And also provide power. So it, this, this particular note carrier has a solar charging circuit. You can kind of see the wires coming in at the bottom. And then, uh, and it, so it has a plug in the JST for the, the battery a little lipo battery tucked around the corner as well as the incoming line from the solar panel cool cool thank you pretty handy actually in the build it really consolidated a lot of electronics all right so with all this, the, oh go ahead i'm sorry i said very cool oh yeah great thank you i appreciate that so um so when i collected all this data and i got it pumped up to the cloud I was able to make a dashboard so I could kind of have easy to work with data, stuff I could share with people, share with city councilmen and women. Um, and this is a, a big part that you should think about in your project because, uh, and I'll, I'll show you later, but if you can't see the data, it's really hard to, well, make sense of what you've done. So, so if I did such a great job and I've got this great dashboard, like what's the matter? Well, it was good for 11 sweet, sweet days, and then it met its demise. Like so many other greats that came before it, its time came too soon. Uh, I, this is part of my learning. Um, I put this box out in April because that's when Earth Day is. It's also a torrential rain season here, and uh, I didn't really account for that. And so uh, it ended up just vanishing from Earth. And so that, that's a pretty expensive lesson. And so that's what I'm here to talk about today is kind of how you cannot fall to the same disaster scenario that I fell to, or even a slow death, which would have come to me if I hadn't have just been wiped out just straight away. And but that's what we'll get into during the talk. So uh, at a high level, just to quickly run down these, some of the lessons I learned we're to monitor the device diagnostics, not just everything that's outside the box, which was like, that was my initial like, hey, I'm here to monitor water quality. So that's all I'm going to sense. I'm looking outside at the water, end of story. 
bad move. Like, uh, I needed to know stuff that was going on inside the box. We'll get to that later. Plan for catastrophic failure. Uh, that, that I absolutely didn't do. And we'll discuss that later. And then, uh, oh, okay. Enable remote DFU. This, this is something that is actually available or was available to me through the note card. And I did not leverage this. This was like a crazy mistake because uh, I, that would have been a lot better to do. Uh, calibrate the sensor so you can trust the data. It's weird. When you let something run in the water all day and night for multiple days, you start to see weird things. And then you wonder about the sensors and or you wonder about what's actually happening. And then to not be a conspiracy theorist, you really need to be calibrating so that you trust it just period and then you can start to extrapolate from the data that you're seeing and then don't forget this is part of the catastrophic failure i get my head out of the way water is a force majeure like it will destroy everything like water destroys everything like just put that note in your back pocket you can think big and get sponsors like I'm sure that all of you have noticed by now that water sensors are like extraordinarily expensive. Uh, a lot of times, some companies that want to try out a new product or just want their name on the outside of a box, or if you'll do a blog post about them, they will sponsor you. That's how I got Atlas Scientific to help me out. Uh, you'll want to design an enclosure for easy maintenance because you will be in and out of it way more than you think. It's not, it's, it seems like it's just real straightforward. It totally isn't. Uh, a big one I learned along the way is to compute in the cloud. We'll talk about that. And spend your time focusing on your core competency. That's another one. And then, it, like I just showed before, data needs to be visualized to be understood or shared around. Okay, so the notes on the enclosure that I kind of came away with, if I was going to redesign or build another one, would be obviously make sure you've got a tight fitting lid with a rubberized seal. I used an ammunition box because I thought I was being clever and uh, it had the rubberized seal along the edge, but it didn't have, it. the plastic was flimsy and um, it, it just didn't have that tight fit. So humidity and water could seep around the edges of that lid and then I would lose uh humidity will it'll get you uh the same way water does it just takes longer and then another thing is the r value or insulation it's really important to have your insulation around your electronics because the temperature swing from full sunlight when you're solar charging to nighttime right before the sun comes up is well in my neck of the woods it's about it can be anywhere between 50 and 30 degrees Fahrenheit. So that causes a lot of condensation with the humidity in the air that is inside the box. And so you can, imagine, you can imagine if your sensitive electronics look like the side of a Coke can and there's just water collecting and running down the side of it, how damaging that actually will be. And a way that you can help work against this in case you don't have a high R value is mount your PCBs. They're normally flat, right? Like a piece of paper. So mount them in a way that at least water will fall off of them, not settle. So like stack them vertically if you can. Um, let's see what else. Oh, you get a low center of gravity. If you're gonna be floating like mine was, I didn't particularly pick a box with a low center of gravity. That makes it want to topple over basically constantly. I ended up giving it a floating skirt, which, which helped my center of gravity substantially, and then it became stable. But this is something you could probably mitigate by having a better enclosure in the first place. Uh, a breakaway anchor point. I will call that mistake number one. I didn't have this. I think I actually drowned my box because I anchored it to the bottom of the stream so it would just kind of float along float along like a little tow boat and not move or like a little pole boat and uh the problem was when the water level rose 10 feet my chain wasn't 10 feet long so it just dumped it 
Uh, and that's as, assuming that that's what happened and it wasn't a tree removed it completely. At least one of those two things, I think at least a tree, I know a tree removed it and I assume that it drowned first because its last chirp was from that location. Uh, choose light or bright colors on the enclosure because of, again, sun. You're making a greenhouse like this uh, box is going to sit in the sun all day. And if it is black, it's going to get as hot as it, it's going to cook and it's going to cook your electronics. Like that's, you don't want, again, this, this all happens with insulation can help all of this too, but you can assist your insulation success by not having dark colors. <laughs> uh, and then let's see. Um, also, I chose bright colors because I used orange so that I could find it. I still haven't found mine yet today. So I could have, I need like, I don't even know, like lights flashing, I guess. I don't even know what you could have done different from mine. But uh, if you ever have to do reconnaissance or go find it in the field, a bright color also helps you figure out where it is. So while it would be nice for it to blend into the scenery so it doesn't look like an eyesore, it also will blend into the scenery and you'll never find it again in case it you know moves even marginally. Uh, let's see what else. Oh, write your contact information on it. So like I said, I can't find my box anymore. Uh, so hopefully someone else does. And I wrote my phone number on the side and I'm waiting for that phone call still. But you know, we'll see. <laughs> and then get a locking clasp because the sensors are expensive and it's not like somebody's gonna steal the sensors out, but they might just be curious and look inside and damage your wiring. That was my bigger concern. I didn't think someone was gonna go steal all my sensors, but I did think someone would be like, what's in here and open it up and then start jockeying around the wires and maybe cause a short. That was one of my big concerns. Uh, you gotta think about it like this because what's actually in the box is like, thousands of dollars of sensors or in my case it was eleven hundred dollars of sensors so I, I tried to illustrate that here with real money that this is what you're thinking about and you should think about it this way because you got to keep money dry you need to keep your electronics dry so just really imagine you're putting paper money inside this box and going to float it that will help you build a really good enclosure because if you trust putting your cash in there like a savings account you would trust putting your electronics in it uh, I did some in field, <laughs> some field testing on it, uh, and this was I stuck this thing in my shower, and just let the shower rain on it, so that I could see how it would handle a rain test. There's another picture that's not showing up on the slide deck that I had it float in my bathtub for a long time to make sure that the seals around the sensors on the bottom held. But do as much testing outside of the water as you can because. If, if this were to cause me a problem, then you can be certain that Mother Nature would absolutely cause me a problem. Uh, let's see. So my sensors, I kind of, I call this mistake number two. Don't forget about the internal sensors. I talked about this a little bit earlier, but if I would have had a really cheap temperature and humidity sensor inside the box, like, oh my gosh. I would have known, it, like this thing ran for 11 days straight, right? I could have known if I was getting weird sensor readings because the temperature in the box had gone nuts or if it was correlated to that or if it was correlated to high humidity inside the box. This would have been so valuable and I didn't have this information and it would have been so easy to implement. You're talking like a $1 sensor. This kills me. This is a huge mistake. Uh, also, I could have put like probably a little like uh, those kind of sensors you put in your basement so you know if it's flooding, like just like two base base two wires. So if water contacts both sides, then I I had it like, you know, I think six or eight inches in that box. And if it, it could easily have sustained four inches of water without having a problem. But if I could have caught it at one inch and given myself an alert, hey, your box is taking on water, uh, that would have been great. I could have saved the box, you know? So like, these are some of the mistakes, like looking back, we're talking like less than $5 and I could have saved 1100. 
So don't forget to monitor what's happening inside the box, not just what's happening outside the box. Uh, this one, monitor with purpose. So th don't just, you okay, first off, unless you're like Bill Gates, you can't really just afford to buy every water sensor that exists, which was my original idea. I'm like, oh, I'll buy them all because they're all like Adafruit $5 sensors. And then I quickly learned that that's not true whatsoever at all. Like they're super expensive. So like you really have to be selective about what you're gonna choose. So have a target about what exactly, what problem you're trying to solve. And then that way you, you're kind of monitoring like sensing or whatever with a purpose in mind. Uh, and then this has a lot to go on to the next thing of monitor complementary data. I've got a slide coming up next so you can see how different data points complement each other to improve either accuracy or understandability of other sensor readings. Uh, preserving the raw data. It, it's, um, what would you say? Like, it's kind of, you're thinking like, well, I've got a microcontroller, it can do all this computation. I should just change my percent dissolved oxygen into uh, milligrams per liter right there in the box and resist that temptation because what happens is you can always find out more information later uh, and if you have the raw reading you can do that calculation at any time you can do that calculation in the cloud which is actually the preferred way to do it and uh, we have a product at Blues called the AirNote. It's made for monitoring air quality as opposed to water quality. And one of the things that we learned was that when we were speaking to scientists about its accuracy, it was they were saying like, just make sure you're capturing raw readings that are not offset. Does somebody have a question? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I was muted. I just cleared my throat. Okay. So the idea is just get yourself some like raw uh, the raw data, and then at any time that you have more information later, a better algorithm later, or anything, you can always rerun that algorithm across the old cataloged data that came raw off the sensors. So that's one thing that you want to do. Resist the temptation to do calculation in the box. Do it in the cloud. Uh, oh, yeah. So I just was talking about how expensive these sensors are. It's still okay to buy cheap sensors if you can find a sensor that's cheap that does what you want. Think about it like this. The error margin on a cheap sensor is big, but it follows the truth. It, it's just like, imagine if you had like a little, like a, a chart that showed like temperature over time. It, and imagine if you had to draw a line with a big fat highlighter and you're like, well, was the temperature 72 degrees or 74 degrees? I can't really tell because the the line you drew was so wide, I can't really see which one you were going for. Or if you had a really fine point pencil and you were able to draw exactly the temperature, think about like the money you spend takes you from a crayon or Sharpie down to a really fine point accuracy. But they're still all effective and they're generally correct even when they're cheap. So don't be discouraged if you can't afford like the million dollar water quality sensor that you wanted. They're all pretty good. They get you in the ballpark. And then it's just however much error margin you can tolerate versus what you can tolerate out of your wallet. You just kind of marry those together and move on. Uh, the calibration of sensor data, I talked about this. I saw weird stuff over 11 days. And so if you don't, <laughs> If you don't trust your data, so you have to trust your data, basically. And then you can say, wow. So whenever the dissolved oxygen dropped from the daytime into the nighttime, that must mean that there was nefarious action and they were polluting at night so nobody would catch them. Like, I don't think that's true because I didn't trust my sensor data, but it could be true if my sensors were accurate. I didn't spend enough time calibrating. I did like the minimum. You need to calibrate this stuff so that you believe it and that you can make real assertions based on what you discover. All right, and let's see. So then this is what I was talking about with complementary data. This slide's a little bit dense, so don't let your eyes roll back in your head. I just want to put that table in here. 
basically to get to change dissolved oxygen from a percentage to milligrams per liter, it requires the temperature and salinity of the water. And then you can take those values, stick it in this giant table right here, and then you get, wait, there it is, a little calculation like this one that describes to you exactly what value you should be seeing. Uh, all right. Uh, we talked about this, calibrate the sensors to trust the data. There's a couple schemes or ideas for calibrating data is if you're able to find high-end third-party third party testing equipment that someone else owns and take a sample of the water and see how your sensor stacks up to the high-end one and then know how far you stray from this as far as your accuracy is. Or if you don't have access to that, buy two sensors. And then you have a kind of redundancy that will ensure relative accuracy. So even if you, you just know the sensor's not going crazy, that there, there two sensors are trying to do the exact same thing, that would also give you a high degree of confidence in your numbers without having to have some high-end or highfalutin testing equipment. Uh, sensor shopping. So like I said before, the ones that I bought were oxygen reduction potential. That tells you like the cleanliness of water, like is it polluted? Is it gonna make you sick if you drink it? Uh, then there's total dissolved solids. This is like how much electricity runs through it. Uh, they're like basically how many chunks are in the water, how many solids are in the water. Dissolved oxygen sounds a lot like oxygen reduction potential and they are heavily related. But dissolved oxygen is more of an indicator of how it can support life. So like fish, there's certain types of fish that can only exist in certain levels of dissolved oxygen. And then when you get down to like hardly any oxygen, that's where it's only bottom feeders. Uh, temperature, picked up the temperature, we all know what that is. Turbidity, that is the clarity of water. And pH, just its level of acidity. So, um, and I put a warning right here, I'll duck down a little bit. That's to remind you that not all sensors are, des are designed for prolonged in situ use. Like this box I was floating was designed to be in floating for indefinitely, right? Not all sensors can do that. So make sure that you didn't buy a lab sensor that's used to dip in a glass, get a reading, take back out and dry off. Because there are several sensors that are probe style sensors that are designed for that versus a probe style sensor that is, is designed to sit there indefinitely. So just be sure to check that. Don't buy the wrong one. They're too expensive to buy the wrong thing. All right, here's my pile of stuff inside the box. So I showed you the picture from outside. This is what all went into it. So uh, basically the Atlas Scientific sensors that we just discussed, uh, the circuit boards that came with them, the other sensors that I couldn't get from Atlas Scientific, I bought from DF Robot. They're in China. Uh, it's really reasonably priced stuff. Uh, and then just various hardware parts like grommets. Like, don't forget grommets. They are the easiest way to seal your sensor to your enclosure and keep water out. And they're clean and they look nice. Uh, what else? I got a lock that goes on the box. And... Yeah, anybody see anything here that they got a question about or they're curious about? Um, in, in general, oh, sorry, somebody else can go. No, go, go ahead. ahead. Uh, in general, what do you think about breaking the box into two pieces and having the, the electron electric components like elevated and having like a probe module submerged with like I like feathers? that. I, I actually, that's, a re that's really great actually so I, I tried to achieve that with one because i was novice right that's what the bottom of this box was submerged in water and uh it was counterweighted to keep it below water at all times and the top of the box i mounted my electronic components to the lid so that it hovered above the water that was and that's why i had like four inches to play with but yeah if you sealed it so you could really focus on sealing the electronics, super smart. I, in, in like in retrospect, I wish I had done that. So um, that's a great idea. And um, what was the other um, question? 
Oh. What about uh, using the onboard GPS to find the unit? Yeah. Floats away. <laughs> That's what a smart guy would do. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not one of those. I'm a lazy guy. So I, I thought about this, and then um, I, Earth Day was coming fast, and so like the end of my hackathon was approaching, and so I just deployed it. And since I didn't give myself the ability to do, I also didn't program remote DFU so that I could do a device firmware update. And so I, if I would have at least done that, then I could have, you know, got to the GPS later, but I totally didn't program it that way, even though it was available the whole time. This was a, it was a huge oversight. I just thought I was going to have time. And like I said, it ended up only living for 11 days, which that, again, also blew my mind. It shouldn't have. I, I should have planned for catastrophic failure. That's, a, that's one of my big points. I just didn't. I was a, it was an idiot move in retrospect. Well, you live, you live and learn. I, I had a, a buoy I deployed off the coast of Maui that webcast the live whale songs for 12 or 14 years. and you know, that was salt water and waves and all of that. So every season you learn and you get to improve or you lose everything, yeah? <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it hurts. That lesson hurts, the lose everything lesson. I mean, I just went through it. Yeah, well, yeah, that's where you pick yourself up and try again, yeah? Yeah, I've got skin in the game too. Like I said, this is like my beloved family farm. Like, I, I'm going to put these back out. It just... I just took it right in the keister. It hurt. Well, that, that's the project with heart. Yeah, that's the whale song project was like that too. I mean, I love the whales. I love the ocean. This is a way of sharing that with the world so people care about it more. And yeah, that's the kind of project that really is meaningful. Yeah. A hundred percent. Well, in the water, water is such a precious resource getting more and more. I'm in California now and we're in a big drought. So that's a cool project you did there. Really, really meaningful work. Awesome, thank you. And let's see, uh, were there any more questions before I move on? Uh, just a note, um, the last year we hacked, my team was working on the sensor and we were like, uh, there's like this resin you can get, like a two part mixture that like super waterproofs, whatever, uh, is permanently frozen inside of it, but for like the base of the sensor cluster, that'd be kind of a good material to seal that connection. Yeah, no, that that would be really smart. So it's put like a, just a kind of a cap. Yeah, yeah, I like, I like that. Like again, had I really been thinking, I should have done something like that. You could yeah, 3D print a little carriage form and then just dump the resin on top of the carriage if you make a little half box for it yeah yeah the deeper you go the more pressure you have to deal with and the seals become even more important <clears throat> right yeah so i was just superficial so i only had like atmospheric pressure and like but uh yeah gosh i can't imagine any ocean stuff yet <laughs> i'm like i was still trying to do creeks <laughs> but all right so then uh, one of the big things to, to take time to plan for when you're doing this hack is here's the difference specifically between data and dashboard. Like, that's a huge difference uh, as far as readability goes, or even seeing a data trend. Because like on the dashboard, there, it's not very visible because the line's yellow, but at the bottom, you can see a, a time graph that lets you at least see what was going on on the sensor as time passed. That's really valuable information it's also captured right here in this it's just impossible to read so make sure you set aside time for this part uh but you don't need to set aside a ton of time use somebody like ubi dots and just pipe your data to them and then it just kind of builds itself like i mean i, I picked the widgets but that's it. it it did all the rest for me all right and then so now the last thing really is firmware considerations uh, I put little note card bullets on these. Uh, and, and oh, by the way, like 
If you're interested at all in incorporating the note card into your project, I'm going to have a coupon code as the last slide. I'm just going to leave it up. That is 15% off for everybody that's attending the webinar. So we're almost to the end, but just hang in there and we'll get to that. And you guys can buy one if you don't want one. I still have really enjoyed giving this talk. So, uh, but the note card bullet points are on the things that are assisted or managed completely by the note card. And it's not just a coincidence because the founder, Ray Ozzie, he built the note card for environmental sensing, remote environmental sensing to solve like a lot of the problems. Like he was having difficulty with LoRaWAN and the fact that you have to share bandwidth and he wanted access to a cellular connection. There are cellular companies like Particle, but their modem wants to stay on all the time. And so it's not very convenient for battery uh, or any kind of low power implementation. And so that doesn't really help it be remote very good. So then this is all like he, with those two problem spaces, the note card was fashioned. And so like, one of the neat things about this is, you know, solve the problem at hand, like solve the one problem you came there for, discover if there's, you know, life in the water or if there's pollutants in the water, spend your energy writing that firmware. And then you can just, like I said, send a JSON blob to this note card as a serial transaction and away it goes and that's it it's already on the cloud done log like it's over so like it mm -hmm. solves that problem uh and then i'll just go down the list kiss and test like keep it simple and test it and that's what i'm saying like don't do a whole bunch of advanced ca calculation inside the the deal just get the data out and that's also less that can go wrong and less that you'll need to update and just test, test, test your firmware to make sure that it will run basically indefinitely without human intervention. Uh, think about how you're gonna update. This is another cool thing that the note card does because it allows you to do, to drop remote, to drop firmware down through the cellular connection so you can push a remote update in case you were an idiot and didn't like enable the GPS to help you save thousands of dollars of equipment. And you decide you do that later. So that helps with that kind of a situation. Uh, make sure that you send a heartbeat so that you know that it's alive and didn't just die out there in the water. Uh, that's another thing. The note card constantly chirps a heartbeat. Uh, power management. So I assume that since you're monitoring water, you're not near electricity. Like that's just kind of like a, those go together pretty good or they don't go to whichever you want to say it. But like, you don't find mains power and water together very often. So um, you'll probably be running off of like a, a, a long life battery or solar power recharging some kind of rechargeable battery. And the note card idles at eight microamps. And so it can just sit there and sip power and then wake up your microcontroller whenever you need to send away data to sample your sensors and send away data. Uh, sensor tuning. This is something, I don't mean calibration, I mean tuning. So this is more like the electrical characteristics of the sensor itself. So like how long does it need to be a, a, like awake for before it starts collecting accurate readings? because sometimes they wake up instantly and they just immediately work. Like the total dissolved solids is literally two electric probes and you just send electricity through it and it comes back how many millivolts ran through it. It takes no warm up time. So I don't need to waste my battery letting the sensor warm up and then get the sample. You just slam it, get like, I think I was taking a hundred samples and taking an average back and sending that on. Uh, versus there was, I can't remember off the top of my head, but one of my sensors took almost a full second to wake up, warm up, and be ready to take good readings. So this tuning is really important because you want to make sure that you're using the sensor to get the best results, but also require the least amount of power so that you can sit there and exist on a battery. And SOS mode, there's another one of my great mistakes. I did not build that in. Uh, 
like I said, if I would have known I had water in the box or if I would have known anything, even I could have sent a remote signal down that said like, hey, there's a god awful rainstorm, uh, go into SOS mode so that I can make sure I'm getting like GPS signals all the time. I didn't do that. I, I like I said, I can't stop kicking myself for this one. Uh, and then data export. Um, uh, yeah, and so the note card, sorry, it has onboard GPS, so it can help you with SOS mode. Uh, the data export, again, that's like the whole primary use case of the note card is just to get it off. Um, so data export, what other things could you do with the data export? You could get a canoe and go out to your sensor out there on the water and plug a computer into it or take a SD card out and swap a new one in. That sounds extremely inconvenient. And to me, it was weighed up to my belly button in freezing cold water and go into the box. So I didn't want to do that. You could use some form of Bluetooth. So if you got nearby it, uh, like for me, I, it was not 20 feet from the shore. So I could have sat on the shore and Bluetooth chatted with it to get data off of it. But then I'd have to write some kind of something to take the data, collect the data, and then do something with it which again, that's a lot of work I would have to do when I had a hard deadline of Earth Day. So like, I, I wasn't trying to give myself a job, I just needed to get it done. Uh, LoRaWAN, LoRaWAN is great because you've got really long coverage, really wide, long coverage uh, into places. It's got a low data bandwidth, which can hurt you sometimes, depending on what you're collecting. Uh, it also is shared, a shared connection. That's probably the biggest problem I think with it is that you don't always have access when you need it. So, um, and then there's cellular and cellular can be a problem. Like I said, in the particle situation because it requires a lot of battery. Like it, it, the cellular radio takes battery. So you just want to keep that thing not hot as often as you can. And so, uh, that's where Blues kind of fixed that and flipped it on its head so that it, it just only uses exactly what it needs. And then I gave an example over here of what the JSON object looks like that you send to it whenever you're sending sensor data. Like it, it's literally this simple. Uh, in Python, you just use the note card library, you create a JSON object, like simple as what you see here, and then you say card transaction and give it the object, it's gone. Like that is it. There is no AT commands. There's nothing to manage the cellular connection. That is all handled by the note card itself. So like this is, you're honestly just send it and forget it. Like that's how it works. But I just wanted to drop that in to just emphasize how easy, it's hard to believe how easy it is until you use it. Power management, uh, some of the things I was talking about, like if you get long life batteries, like the US Coast Guard uses Pateran batteries. Uh, they seem to last like forever whenever they're not they're used. They don't have much of a leak current. So you can stick them in something and they just seem to exist indefinitely. It's not indefinite. It's like 30 to 40 years, but it's insane. And so they just don't leak. So it only use, loses what, it, what you use out of it. Um, so that's one option where it's just don't ever think about charging it. Maybe your project is only going to run for three months or a year and you can put a Tataran in it and that's fine. Like you didn't need to charge it. Uh, if you don't have, if that's not gonna work for you and you want to last longer, then, uh, or you plan to use a lot of battery for whatever you're intending to do, solar charging with the LiPo is something that's, the option that works best for me. Cause it gives me a lot more flexibility because I can, modify the behavior based on how much battery that I've got available to me. Uh, uh, that's a quick question. Yeah. Um, how do you think like a couple uh, 18650 cells would have fared versus having the solar panel charging the batteries? Like how long do you think the I could have gone for? Uh, so like 18650s are chargeable batteries and they can plug into the note carrier. So uh, I just I was I, I used what I had handy and I was being cheap and I used the like Adafruit lipo pouch but I mm. ordered them they just didn't get here in time but I have 18650s to plug into it and they're rechargeable so like that 
that's totally a viable solution. And they can last, like you know, for a long time because they've got a lot more capacity than a regular battery does. So I that, think that, uh, for project batteries. Okay, cool. The, so you used uh, used an Arduino with that note card, and did the note does the note card get its power through the Arduino, and is it compatible with the Raspberry Pi also? Obviously, it would be right. That is correct. So yes, it's compatible. We have a, a, a okay. So let's talk about those things separately. Um, the answer is yes to all the questions, and then the way that it works with the Arduino because the Arduino is a microcontroller is I powered the Arduino through the note carrier, which support, which has the note card on it. So the note carrier had my solar charging connection as well as my battery. So it had the full power management IC on it. So it could do the charging, it could do the battery and the note carrier was kind of my power source. It powers the note card and it powers the attached MCU. And I was using an ESP32 with the Arduino, uh, whatever, whatever it is, Live Pal or whatever you want to call it. So I had the Adafruit Huzzah 32. Um, hmm. That's what my project had. As far as the Raspberry Pi goes, yes, you can do the exact same thing as I just discussed, or we have a note carrier designed to go like as a hat on the Raspberry Pi, it's a Pi hat carrier. And it, it inverts the power behavior. It takes its power from the Raspberry Pi because the Raspberry Pi typically consumes more power than the note card, whereas it's the reverse situation for an MCU. It typically, typically consumes less power than the note card. Oh, that's cool. Because I have a, I got a, uh, like a, a hat. 18650 cradle for a Raspberry Pi, but it's just been sitting for a year since I bought it. So oh, nice. if that could power the Pi, then the Pi powers the hat, the uh, note card, that might be. And it would all run just right there off of your 18650s. Yeah. So that's available on our website. And like I said, in like three or four slides from now, I've got a 15% off coupon, works on all that stuff. Okay. Uh, yeah. So definitely check that out. Like that. That would totally work with your project. And like I said, it just makes it dead simple. Uh, cool. And then I don't, I'm trying to think about like put myself in the mind of Raspberry Pi right now. Uh, the note card typically can put the host MCU to sleep. I don't know that that works with the Raspberry Pi hat. Um, I don't know that it doesn't either. This is just something I haven't tried yet. Uh, okay. But if you have like a microcontroller, what the note card does is it has a, a latching interrupt and so the microcontroller will send a message to the note card and say put me to sleep and then the note card pulls this latch down and then it disables the enable pin of the microcontroller and so it goes to sleep and then the note card whenever you told it to put you to sleep you also told it like wake me up in a half hour wake me up in an hour wake me up in five minutes wake me up when you get jostled like whatever it has a handful of onboard sensors like an accelerometer and some, let's just focus on the accelerometer. I don't want to say something that's not true. But if it gets jostled, you can have it so that it wakes up when it's jostled. You can have it so it wakes up at a timing interval. And like, there's a couple others that I can't think of right off the top of my head and I don't want to make up something. Uh, but it's pretty clever the way that it works, but it allows you to just sip power. Cause like I said, it idles at eight microamps. So it's like nothing. Um, and, then, okay. and then it'll, connect as necessary. All right, and then DFU, can't harp on this enough. This is, I, I neglected to put this in because I was in a hurry. We have the ability to do this through the note card. I was just being lazy uh, and it, it's already written for me. Like I, I had to just copy and paste the code in. I was that lazy. It's like, it is, I deserve to lose a thousand dollars lazy uh, is what happened, but um, yeah, if I had done that, then I could have been pushing new firmware that took advantage of like that GPS sensor. So I could have been like, hey, since you're floating down the creek now or completely lost or you're in the lake or I don't know where it's at anymore, uh, send out some like beacons so I can go collect it. Like that would have been great. And I could have just pushed new firmware that just only sent a beacon. Didn't even have to be, doesn't have to do anything else at that point, right? I just need to go save it. 
So, uh, like I said, that was a swing and a miss, but it's available and it's available through the note card. So you can send firmwares down and like the Raspberry Pi, we've, we've got a deal where we, uh, one of the guys at work set it up so you can push a Python script to like a cloud storage place that then gets pulled down by the Raspberry Pi and then it uploads, it, it refreshes its Python script. So it's like having new firmware. Uh, and then here's my picture of the catastrophic failure. You saw that pretty creek at the beginning if you were here. And this is like uh, WTF, whoa, that flooded. Like, I, it, was, it just decimated everything in the water. This, this was after it calmed down enough that I could drive to this bridge. It came over the highway. Like, so it was insane. But uh, that's how I lost my box was this. And again, I could have planned for it had I just taken a couple of extra steps that were available to me. Like this is, and I just was lazy. So don't be lazy. That's probably the advice. Plan for this, because if you don't, then you're just gonna guarantee that this is what's gonna happen. If you do, it'll never happen, but if you don't, they'll get you. So uh, <clears throat> what I would have done, I would have added the salvage mode, like I talked about, had the GPS location and the sump pump. That would have saved my bacon. And that's my talk. And now it's time to just open it up. And if anybody wants to talk about whatever, I'm here for you. There's the webinar coupon code. Uh, use that to buy hi hats, note cards, note carriers. We have a feather deal if you, in case you have like the ESP32 with a feather. Like this is what this this guy right here. Like that. And I've got the. And I'll, try, I'll try to hold it up. I've got a project in progress but this is what oh it's green so green screen won't work well imagine that it wasn't blue and it was green but it's got the rails on it so that you can just plug in like your feather compatible board or you can get a board like i showed in my pictures which just has four wires for either uart or i2c and power and ground so which you would hook up to like a 18650 cradle 18650 cradle on the Raspberry Pi, you mean? Oh, or on uh, this? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yes. I'm sorry. So let me, yeah. Hold on. I actually, is it sitting right here? I put it away. Okay. Unfortunately, I put it away. But yeah, absolutely. Like, I have like a clip with two 18650s in it and a pigtail off as a JST connector. And that board and also the, the other the note carrier AL, which is for LiPo has like a JST connector and you just plug in and then it powers the whole board. That totally works. Okay. They do these all day. Like, I think they're great. I've got a ton of them now. I just didn't when I built the project the first time. So I duct taped one of those stupid LiPo pouches to the side of the enclosure. Uh, okay. Zach, we did have a few questions come in through chat, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah, please, let's have them. One person asked if there were other ways to deploy than having it the unit in the water like say a sampling approach where the unit dips in the water on a schedule and then resets to a default position or possibly suspend the sensors into the water from a permanent position above ground if they're not going to be able to do much follow-up because they're in a noisy environment but if you can kind of talk through your ideas on that topic yeah so i like the suspension from above that would have saved me because of a flood, right? Like I would have just had a box in a tree somewhere. That would have been great. Um, and as far as dipping down goes, I mean, you can definitely run, sir. Like I'm, I'm thinking off the cuff because I didn't do it this way, but like you could totally attach it to a servo and have it dip in, take a sample and dip back out. And you could use like the box as a filtering system so that it would keep debris away. Um, or some kind of, you know, even a cup, anything could happen where it could just collect a sample with some kind of electric motor and then, or even a pump. Yeah, that would totally work too. You could use like a pump, uh, a peristolic pump, suck water in from outside a fully sealed enclosure internally into a reservoir with all of your probes in it to sample that and then pump evacuate it. That would completely work. And also that we keep your, probes sampling without being permanently uh, in the water. That would work. And like I said, suspending from above, you gotta have something above water, which that would put me, like in my situation I did, I had trees. 
Uh, that trees make it hard to solar charge. But again, I totally wish I had tied off on a tree instead of an anchor because I'd still have one. Fantastic. The next question is, I'm thinking about using Blue's wireless products for a project I'm working on for a not-for-profit. How are they to work with? Also, why did you choose Blue's over Particle? Ah, yeah, okay. Couple reasons. Uh, full disclosure, I work at Blue's, so that helped, made it. <laughs> but, but no, actually, you would want to choose Blue's over Particle for anything that's remote because of the way that it does power management. This is something Particle does not do well. So um, it, it power management, I spoke to it a lot during this talk, but it is crucial for making your battery last. And so I really uh, couldn't emphasize enough how if you're doing any kind of remote sensing that this is the better option. If you're on mains power, you can put the note card into a uh, state that it operates exactly like particles where it just uses power all the time and keeps a constant connection that can happen too uh, so uh, and then the other thing that you could do is um, oh, I had it and I lost it but there's one more thing that oh yeah you can retrofit the note card into anything because it operates over over any serial connection with the data payload as opposed to requiring your entire operating system to be written on particle like right now particle is an operating system so all of your sensors you have if you have an existing project you have to rewrite that thing on the particle boron uh, and move the code over and then deploy it to their hardware whereas this is a piece of hardware that is more like a peripheral where your existing project stays exactly like it is and you just send text out with the JSON blob on it to the note card and then it goes away to the cloud. So it, like I said, Blues came after Particle and so it's kind of seen the problems that Particle had and improved on them a little bit. That's why I would use Blues now instead of Particle. Particle's got a really compelling offering and like a lot of my friends work there and I'm a shareholder in Particle. So if you wanna go with them, that's also great for me. But uh, I think, Blues is your best bet, if I'm being honest with you. Did I, did I miss part of that question? I feel like I answered the second half. I don't remember what the first was. I'll look for a follow-up here, but so far, no follow-up's been submitted. Okay. Well, how much, how much does it cost after you've used up your 500 megabytes um, if you wanted to stream? Uh, how do you resubscribe or pay for your data after that? I actually don't know that answer i know you can i know that it can't cost more than a whole new note card because then you would just do that and they're only i think 50 bucks anyway so it could never eclipse that price i don't know what it is the, but the idea is like sensor data <clears throat> i found i discovered this like on my own uh i got free five megabytes of data in a sensor stream somewhere i'm like five megabytes what a joke but I was capturing RGB data, and that's literally like two bytes of information. And uh, I was like, it lasted, I, I recorded an entire day's sunrise and sunset RGB colors, uh, and it didn't even touch it. And I, I did the calculation, it would have ran for well over a year collecting that on five megabytes. So then like think about 500 megabytes and think about what you're actually sending over. And like, I'm, I'm trying to implore everybody, take the raw sample, which is typically on the order of one or two bytes and send that up and do your, your calculation in the cloud where you actually make information out of data. Do that in the cloud, don't do it on the device and then send some giant piece of information up. Send the data up, which is usually tiny and small and this 500 megabytes kind of lasts like forever. If you're trying to, to do like video, it won't work for that. And, and photographs would really be pushing it. It wouldn't last very long for you that way either. One of it, like I said, it just depends. There are jobs that it's better suited for, that's true. But you can re-up it, I know that. I just don't know the, the 
process. So I don't want to tell you something that's not right. Well, how, what's the best way to find that out? I would say at uh, blues.io, they okay. will definitely discuss it there in the pricing, I'm sure. Yeah, the way that it works is there's, <clears throat> we do charge for data egress if you go over 5,000 routed events per month. For your general sensors like we're talking about, that's a, that's a very generous free tier and we hope you can stay under it. If you do, however, uh, there's not a top up plan for that, you know what I mean? But if you move into one of the, the other tiers, the price is 475 per 150 megabytes and includes one more year to use it. So you'd be at 650 megabytes in 11 years would be your sort of constraints for another four dollars and 75 cents okay so yeah it sounds like you can move off the free plan which makes so, sense so if i have this out in the ocean and i didn't want to retrieve it i could up the plan sounds like. yeah 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 and basically the plans if you go to blues.io and you look at the services section which is where we talk about data egress services you'll see there's a free plan and then there's another plan that's also free per product for project and then we charge and i think these decimal points are hard for me to figure out but it's 0. 0.00075 of a dollar per event so i mean it's fractions and fractions of a, a cent here to route something out and that's only after you spill over your free ones right which renew every month is that true i think so sounds okay. right i've never been asked that before it sounds a bit like if you're a guy like me or if it's just you making specifically a buoy in the ocean and you have one you probably won't hit 5,000 events a month because, or three or five, I don't know which one it is, uh, but because like that would cost you a lot of battery to do that. Mm -hmm. so. And it's also fair to say like if the workload you're imagining is like streaming video or pictures, then this, this product really isn't designed for that. It's designed for sensor data. Gotcha, so no audio either then. So you, I mean, you, you can do it, but you'd want to do it exceedingly rarely. Like, so one of the things that we do actually as an example is we use edge impulse on a microcontroller and let it just determine what's important information so that if you're going to make a big transaction like audio, you would make sure it captured a whale song exactly and not a passing boat or something else so that you're making the best use of what you're sending across. There are ways to filter anything down so that you can, um, uh, whatever, maximize your data. Gotcha. You could say uh, that's boat noise, don't record it. Yeah. Right, exactly. And like yeah. I said, it's just an Edge Impulse neural network model. We partner with Edge Impulse a lot. That's why I'm saying their name specifically, but it could be any neural network or learning. <clears throat> Yeah, and it's Great. also oh, worth mentioning right. that if what you're trying to do is analyze the whale songs, then maybe there's characteristics in whale songs that equal a happy whale and one that's a whale in distress. And if you can teach that model to edge impulse and train it through sampling, then it could just tell you, hey, there's a distressed whale at this GPS buoy or there's okay. happy whales here and you wouldn't need to ship the audio oh, somewhere. So these types <laughs> of edge processing it's actually available and more simple to do than you would think uh, i don't know if that's your workload but you know sometimes that's well, a, a better path forward well that that's valuable to know for the research community yeah but people are spent decades trying to figure out the meaning of the songs and what they're saying so that's a whole other project <laughs> mm. Yeah, I mean, like another thing you could do is you could get like a flash and record all of these whale sounds on like, or like an SD flash, like a an SD card. Record your whales, like first off, use machine learning to make sure it's a whale song. When it's a whale song, record the whole thing and so you're not wasting your space or whatever. And then you could report the diagnostics like, hey, the SD card's getting full, it's time to come fetch it. Or this SD card barely has any activity, don't bother to drive the boat out here. Like it's 
perfectly valid for that because way less than what you pay for boat gas, you would pay for a note card. Absolutely. Like, and plus, you know, you don't, we lost one of our boys crossing the reef during high surf because the batteries were dead before we put solar panels on. And yeah, you, you, uh, diagnostics all day. And then when you want yeah. to get like your whale sounds, you could use it for telling you about the whale sound while you recorded it some other way that, and then, you know, there's time to go pick it up and you're going to have a bountiful harvest for driving. it. It's like knowing that your lobster trap is full of cra uh, lobsters instead of pulling up an empty one, you know, you're not wasting your time. Yeah. But I can think, I could, I could think of a thousand ways based on what you're saying that it could be really helpful. Thank you. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, it's, yeah, this is what's all the time. This is this is kind of random and outside of my area of expertise. But um, is it possible to transmit audio as like data and like reassemble it as a compressed audio file after it's received? Kind of like a um, what do you call that? Base sixty four image. Yeah. Okay. So sort of. Like, uh, the answer is roughly that's correct. It's not exactly the way you stated it, but we were looking at um, doing, uh, me and the founder were talking about trying to see what that would look like. We haven't done that experiment yet, so I can't give you any kind of real reality about how that would turn out, but like audio compression, but it's more, it might have been, I don't remember if we were going to do text. We might have been trying to talk about text to speech instead of actual audio. So you're just sending like a word, which is way smaller than a wave file. But, or I don't, I don't remember if we were trying to make walkie talkies. We had this, we were my, like, uh, brainstorming this, but like it, it didn't, haven't had time to piddle with it yet, to be honest with you. Um, and I don't remember, like I said, it's kind of one of those like, we're just like this conversation it's not official it's just we're having it and we're thinking about it right now uh yeah. we, we kind of did this little mental exercise i don't remember it was a while ago so i don't really remember it very clearly about what we had decided but we wanted to test out some of that stuff but still like audio is not as bad as video but it's still big and you're gonna burn up just remember it's 500 megabytes and if you have one megabyte audio files and you got those once a day and you were happy that a year and two thirds was enough time for you to record one megabyte of audio a day, then it worked perfectly for you. I mean, the, the, at the end of the day, you don't need to go out to 10 years. It's 50 bucks, right? So think of it that way. Like we had a company that I, I think was talking about putting it in concrete to watch concrete cure from the inside. It's obviously going to be dead, like, but and they were just going to use the bandwidth really fast because they didn't care. They had way more bandwidth than they needed, and then they would die. But fifty dollars was so much cheaper relative to what the the project of like whether the concrete cured correctly or not. They just didn't care at all. It was like a complete commodity to them. So like you can use these and lose them too, right? You can just use it by new and use it by new and or like a throwaway case because they're not they're not they're not dirt cheap but they're not insanely expensive either it's, it's i'm not on the site cool. right now was that the swan that you had in your sensor yeah uh, oh uh, so yeah, the, the swan's our new product yes uh this was created on earth day so it did not have a swan i had the esp32 from adafruit the huzzah 32 any feather compatible MCU will work. Ours is a really cool feather compatible and I tested the firmware on it and it still works. Uh, just, you know, it could easily be swapped, but it didn't exist when I made this project or it would have had that. Huh, interesting. Yeah. There's another more question from the chat when we're finished with this one. Oh, okay. Was there anything more you wanted to discuss about the one? Uh, I was just going to say I'm more comfortable with the Raspberry Pi, but I might, if I, if I wanted to go that route, I'm kind of leaning towards going with the SWAT. Do you guys do any sort of um, mentorship or development support for this hackathon? Uh, yeah, I'm going <clears> to, <throat> sorry. 
Uh, you can contact me. I'm happy to help you. I've got like a probably about an hour a week I can offer to it. And um, okay. I don't know how to get in the official pool, but if, uh, I don't know. I didn't put my email anywhere on this slide deck, but you're welcome to reach out to me and I will help you as I can. I can't give you like full hands-on help, but I can help if you get stuck. We also have like a really great forum and like you don't really even need me. I'm happy to help you, don't get me wrong. But we have a great forum and we have a guy on there 24 seven who's just answering everything. And so uh, a lot of the questions you're gonna have have already been asked. And if you come up with something new, it's like Johnny on the spot. I think that he answers them in like three hours. Like that's his average time. It's not, it, that's not a guarantee. Almost back that up. But he is really fast to answer. So like you're not left waiting for days like that. There's tons of people that have commented how much they appreciate how rapidly the response comes back. Yeah, Blues is by developers for developers. So we do spend an, an inordinate amount of time and focus on making sure that developers can be successful uh, with materials and support and training and all the different elements that you can imagine. So, you know, I'd hope to give you some level of confidence there that it's something we focus on and measure all the time. Yeah, and it's also like, I, I can't emphasize how how simple it is. Like that, that, let me, I'm gonna back up this slide real fast just to show you that Python again. Like that's real, this isn't made up. There's one more of these JSON objects that tells it what you named your project on your Node Hub account, and that's it. So it's like two JSON, like one's a setup JSON that you send one time ever to the device, but really you just kind of set it at the beginning of each time it boots. And then every time you want to send data, it looks like this. Like that's it. That's literally it. So like it is truly just dead simple, like to where you'll be like, dang. Uh, it's it's great and but we're there to help too like i said we're hugely developer focused like dan was saying and i will figure out i already i promised the the people at the hackathon when they told me about the hackathon that i would help out by offering up some of my time i need to figure out how to get in the system so and then you can hit me up directly too but like i said our our, our forum is like really great actually all right cool so the, the current question is, my impression is that maintaining cellular connection also consumes data that counts against the allowance. What's the magnitude of that? That's true. The magnitude is controlled by you. So um, every time that you connect to the tower, there will be a handshake. And, that, and, and like I said, we, it's not our data plan, it's our note card. So like we can't control you know, it's a fixed 500 megabytes that we can't like say, hey, that's on us. So we, we take that against it. Like we can't do that. But you're right. It does. Every connection um, counts against it. But so what you want to do is either stay connected so that it if you have the battery, stay connected so that you don't pay for the handshake. Uh, if you don't have the battery, then the note card, I didn't mention this and I totally should have, works as a queue. It You queue data against it. So those little payloads that like I sent back, I showed back there, they just queue. And then you flush the queue whenever you deem it appropriate. So which like for mine, I wanted updates from this thing every 30 minutes. Uh, so what I would do is, but I wanted samples of data every three minutes. So I would sample, 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 sample. When the queue size was 10, I would flush it. So, uh, and then that way I'm only paying for the connection every 30 minutes. And that's a pretty aggressive connection frequency. Like this is monitoring water. The monitoring was happening every three minutes. I just was aggressively taking the data away so I could make a dashboard look good in a presentation. So really, if you were okay with your data being a day behind, you could get massive battery savings where you could constantly sample, queue it into the note card, and then at the end of the day, just tell the note card to phone home and send all of your queue. And then you wouldn't be paying very much for that transaction at all, and you would be getting the value of having timestamp data points 
throughout the entire day. Hey, hey Zach, quick question on that. Yeah. Do you, do you get an acknowledgement when you send, when you transmit, so that your your device was underwater and you couldn't make a connection when it tried to send? Yeah. Does it know to try to resend after a certain set of time? Right. So the note card has a microcontroller on it itself. That's why it's so simple to use. Uh, so it has its own retry logic that is uh, intended to be like battery conscientious always. That's its default mode. You do get a response from that microcontroller that like when you instruct it to do something, you can see that it failed if you need to go to that level. Also, remember the other half of this is when it's successful, it shows up on your Note Hub account. So it's just like there. So it's, at some point it's either there or not there, right? So- yeah, But it's more if it's not there, I want it to- For the retries. Yeah. yeah, and so it, it, like I said, it does have a, uh, we dialed it back. It actually had a really aggressive retry and it like just decimated our batteries and we're like, oh crud. So we dialed it back to be battery conscious, conscious, but um yeah so yes you can i'm, I'm trying to i was trying to think on the fly about what that code looks like whenever you send it stuff oh uh, yeah, yeah 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 sorry you can ask for its status and it will report to you i was unable to connect and then you can say sync now that's exactly what you do sorry it took me a minute because i was trying to program in my head on the fly there but yeah so what you do the whole time and then when you send that sync instruction it just kind of says okay, I received your instruction, which lets you know that there wasn't a failure on the I2C or UR lines. And then you would check back in like, I don't know, whatever you thought was an appropriate amount of time, like maybe five to 10, 15 seconds and say, like, tell me your status. And the status will come back okay, or I'll give you an error message. And so if the status, you, if you say, give me status and it responds with like, oh, didn't work, then you're like, sync now. And you could play that game until you were satisfied that the data was gone. Is there a way of asking the note card? Oh, sorry. I was going to say it'll also try to hit that tower like two or three times before it just gives up on its own without you asking. Okay. Is there a way of asking the note card? Are you connected? So if I've lo you mentioned before, I could stay connected all day if I wanted to. If I if I'm in that environment. Can I ask the note card, are you connected just in case it's lost it and then I'm not gonna try? Yes. I'll just I'll just you know store my data and wait till you wake up. Yeah, so ba basically it manages most of that on its own, but you yeah. can take a more active role like what you're suggesting by querying the status. We have really good diagnostics. Again, like I said, this was a purpose-built device by Ray whenever he, like Fukushima, you know, that like that reactor in Japan that exploded with the tsunami, like that's what birthed the note card because he was part of a citizen uh, group that came together to build a solution to monitor air quality to see if people were getting poisoned. And uh, he ran into all these problems of trying to capture data remotely off batteries and get it up to the cloud. And so he's like, this is crazy. I need to make a solution for this. So like all these diagnostics and things that were important, he didn't just like delete that stuff because he needed it when he was building it. It was built, very purpose built. And so all this, this like super, like kind of polished diagnostics are available to you where you can query the status, uh, a whole bunch of informational stuff about the card, the note card itself. So, which would like what you're wanting to do. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, and just one more thing. Our API can be viewed at uh, dev, like dev.blues.io. Uh, you can see the in the reference section, there's like a note card API. And then that would give you all the like, I think if you look under card, like it's like card status, card version, card a whole bunch of stuff you can kind of see like what the API allows and what a simulated response looks like. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. In terms of configuring the back end, um, how do I get it to point to my application server? Yeah, 
So this is also super awesome. So it pops in at your NoHub account, but we have these things called routes. And a route is basically exactly what you want. Like it, we have preset routes where you can automatically just go to like AWS, uh, Azure, uh, like a huge list uh, of stuff. And then we have like one where it's custom and then that's where you'll go in there and you'll just set like your URL, any uh, headers that you need, like if they have tokens or whatever. Uh, and then you'll tell it to send on that, that JSON blob. Like I, I did it, uh, I abused our little set, our routes there so that it can send to Twilio. And so now I send myself text messages from like my mailbox right now. That's my, my, my favorite everyday project is I just took this thing so that whenever the door opens on my mailbox, I get a text message. So I know that my mail arrived. I want that. Yeah. So anybody else have a question? We done? So on the website. Yeah. Oh, somebody else. <clears throat> Uh, I guess so. Um, on the website, there's the Raspberry Pi starter kit and the Feather starter kit for Swan, which is pre-ordered. Um, I'm kind of thinking I want to get one up and running as fast as possible and focus on like the enclosure and maybe separating the sensors with the tether. Um, A, would the pre-order arrive in time to have time to work on that? for uh, this hackathon and B, if I went with the swan and things are like open the source, it's literally just plug in the sensors, hook up the hat, hook up the battery, plug in some kind of API key that I have to send the data back to my, um, or your backend, the blues backend, and then just give it power and that's it. Uh, yeah, I think so. So let me, I'm gonna recap that to make sure that I, I'm not agreeing to something that I don't understand. Uh, but yeah, you would buy a note card, note carrier, and Swan. And um, that you don't have to buy the note carrier AF. You can just buy like a note carrier AL, which has all the battery and power management stuff in it. Uh, this is what the AF morphed from. It was an AL that they added a feather socket, socket onto. So if you want to get going today, just go buy an AL, get the Swan, you apply power to the deal, and you'll send a single, like uh, one single instruction. You don't even actually, you can plug it into your computer and go to dev.blues.io, and we have a web serial terminal there if you're in Chrome, and you can just configure it to your account, like right there. And then it will start sending data to your account from your laptop. And then just whatever you send to it from your Arduino that you get going on the Swan, or if you want to program from straight from the STM32 HAL, uh, whatever, whatever you write and send to it will just show up there without any kind of API key. You just have to configure it one time. So uh, yeah, it's pretty much just apply power and it's not even an API key. It is your project. You identify your project, and then on the back side, you accept that it's yours. And then I think that that's it. I'm, I'm like, say, I'm thinking on the fly right now, okay. so like, don't pin me to this. But it, it's I'm not leaving out giant steps for sure. It's not like it's way harder than that. Yeah, it, it's like you get going that fast. It's hard to believe. Um, you said no carrier AL. Yeah, no carrier AL. That's like lipo. Um, yeah. I don't see that in the no carrier things. Um, wouldn't I need a dev kit that has the uh, uh, cellular module and the no carrier? Y yeah, I, I. Let's see. You can always buy them separately. You don't have to have buy. I mean, the kit is just them put together. I think like an Amazon, like buy this and that. You know, buy these three items together, and it's the same price. I think that's what the kit is. I don't okay. know that. So like you can just choose a note card, an AL and the Swan and you're like off to the races. Yeah, I think the AL might be listed as note carrier A with LiPo battery connector. Does that sound okay. right? That does sound right. Sorry, 
I guess we have internal slang and I'm not speaking marketing speak. My apologies. I, I have a question. Yeah. I, uh, oh, good. You can hear me. I wasn't sure. Um, I'm actually the one who sent the question earlier about um, Particle and the not-for-profit I'm working for. It's kind of cool. Uh, it's in Buffalo, New York, and they re it's basically a uh, electric bicycle share for um, economically disadvantaged people. They received um, over 5,000, I'm sorry, 3,500 bikes from Jump Bike after Jump Bike was going to throw them out. So a local company got them, and I've been working with them um, on the hardware, and that's why I was asking about, um, you know, versus, you know, blues versus particle. We're not quite at the point where we are actively developing hardware, but we're getting close on that. Um, but the question I have isn't related to that. <laughs> I just thought I'd plug them. Uh, it's they're, they're called shared mobility. But anyway, um. Uh, have you thought about for like general purpose IoT kind of stuff, um, getting uh, rules, recipes for if this and that? Because like uh, I could I could see this being used for like even like a uh, you know a home uh, IoT network where you might have say like a uh, um, uh, filter, you know, pool filter that you'd like to turn on and off or, you know, something in your yard where you might want to communicate. Um, you know, I suppose you could use LoRa, but it cellular might be a choice too. Yeah. So I considered that and I am actually, I was pushing for that. It seems like we have a lot of people in the company that use Zapier and they like to use Zaps instead of ifs or whatever you call them. I don't know. What if so if this I, and that, IFTTT? Yeah, that's what I oh. use. I use that for a bunch of stuff. So I yeah, like that. Awesome. And I'm uh, I'm biased. But <laughs> yeah. I think that we were wanting to get Zaps on Zapier going first. And then okay. I don't know. So, you know, that's maybe this is a TBD thing. I don't know where our resources are. I can't speak to that at all, actually, because I don't work yeah. on, the, on the hardware team. But I could have a personal request for it, so I can, and I'll use you as an example of why my my choice is really important. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, and shamelessly, I'm going to ask, are you guys hiring? I'm an embedded developer, DSP and IoT stuff. I'm looking for work. I, you know, do you have stuff on your web page? Should I just look there? I'm sure we have a careers page, and I we're growing. So we, if we're not now, we will be. So. I don't okay. have the answer to that. I'm not like a hiring manager. I'm just yeah, a, yeah, no. I just thought I'd ask. <laughs> yeah, no, right on, man. That's cool. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, like I said, just watch the way we're growing, so we will be. That's a fact. Yeah, it seems like you're in a good position, and that you know the answer about um, particle, because I, you know, I sort of was investigating both, and the idea that you're not, you don't have to buy into a whole system. You can just use it as a peripheral is a big deal. Yeah. I think like that's so underestimated because like I was working actually before I worked at Blues, I was doing like a side gig with a bunch of people that had like a semi truck trailer or some random thing that they had built. And they were just like, we just need like IOT on this thing. And I'm like, I don't know what to tell you, man. Like you need to rewrite all of it or understand how to talk to a modem, which is horrible, which this is eliminated. Like if the note card would have been a, a thing, back then I'm like just plug a note card in it man you guys have TXRX all day long you know send it and it's, it's gone it's right where you want it to be yeah I have a bunch of uses like I'm, I'm actually working on I do some tech work for artists and there's a, a project that I implemented I don't know seven years ago but it needs an upgrade and it's a weather station that's on top of an art museum here in Buffalo <laughs> that uses the weather data as input to video on the front, the facade of the museum. And I'm thinking like this idea of dumping the data over cellular because it's cheap enough, you know, it's perfect for it. So yeah, yeah I'll be, I'll be buying a few of these for different things. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Like I said, once you like start, it's so flipping easy. Like I, I've actually had to build like using AT commands. I tried to use the SIM 808 once and I was like, pulling my hair out 
and it's like, oh God, you got to manage the connection. It's like, eh. and well, like, on top of that, I didn't, on. like you just said, I didn't, it's, like, put this on the cloud for me, and it's like, okay, like yeah, that idea that like you buy the card and you've got you know a reasonable amount of data for ten years is like a big deal as well. I mean, you know, the idea of having to manage, you know even figure that out but you know this is you buy it and you're done that's all. oh yeah i was gonna say also for my little my own roll your own cellular project i bought like a ting sim card which was the cheapest at the time but i forgot to cancel that thing and i ended up paying like 240 dollars for cellular data plans that i never even used except for like once and it was like that sucks too I mean, and you don't have to do that and you also don't have to be like and then i have a whole bunch of other things because of that experience where i'm like I'm not gonna use this yet because I need just the right project. But now it's like, forget all that stuff. In 10 years, I'm, I'm, uh, I will have either lost this or it would have caught on fire by that point. But my, you know, so it's like, I, whatever. Like I can just freely use it to experiment with without worrying about like a Taylor data plan or any of that junk or even having to pay the transaction fees. Cause when you're just hacking, it is completely free. Uh, but like, like yeah. if you, where you turn it into a business and you're sending tens of thousands of messages, then it's no longer free. But like at the level of experimentation, it's free and it's awesome. Yeah, I, I actually just bought a Swan for another project. I don't need the connectivity, but the fact that it's using uh, Edge Impulse is important to me. And it's got, um, you know, it's got that carrier card because I need, um, I have, I'm using six, six or seven motion sensors and they're I squared C and they only have two addresses. So I need three I squared C ports. Well, that nice so I can do that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I cool. just have to figure out how to solder that on there. I haven't ever done that before. Yeah. That's, you gotta have some patience and a lot of flux. Like I've done it. Yeah. I, I just ordered some solder paste and a flux pen and yeah. uh, that's coming Saturday. So we'll see how the weekend goes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. Like, I I did it. It's just patience and flux. That's what I would. Oh yeah, say. yeah. And no coffee. You you do it before you have any coffee. Just, you don't want shaky hands. Yeah, you need brain surgery. Yeah. yeah All right. Thanks, man. Of course. Sorry, just to jump in again, just for my own benefit. There, you were talking about edge impulse, and I'm really curious about that as well. Yeah. Um, what configuration would you recommend? I think you mentioned before about the note and the carrier AL, um, or would you just look at a dev kit? Like I, I'm not, I'm not familiar with Swan or your platform, so oh, okay. I'd rather just do it once and be able to play with that environment. Okay, so like I'm gonna give you like just a, you don't have to buy blues to use use Edge Impulse. No, I, I understand that. I, I've got a number of different devices for that. I'm more curious about integrating with you as a communications or as my backhaul. Oh yeah, okay, great. Yeah, so all the all you need to use the note card and a note carrier, you wanna get both of these things unless you're able to, well, unless you wanna build your own note card. You have to have a note card, you're able to build your own, uh, but you sh should start with one of ours to get the idea. That's what I would say. But so you buy these two pieces, and then um, it you literally you just communicate with PX RX or with I2C, and either one of those is fine. And that's how you offload a J a sync like a JSON blob or a JSON object. I'm sorry, a JSON object of what you want to send over to that, and it sends it away. So okay. like it can be integrated with anything. So if you have a microcontroller, full computer, whatever it is that is running edge impulse and doing modeling and all that kind of stuff, then you can capture the result of the model, which is normally all you care about anyway, and send that at like, they, they, like you know, like CAT for cat is so much easier to send than a picture of a cat. You know, so like, <laughs> that's the idea. And then you just put that in the payload and you can say it comes timestamp. It, it's got like geolocation information already baked into it because it's the cellular communication. And we just give you all of that too to work with. So you so don't have to additionally collect all of this. Since right. that comes in and you're paying for it anyway, we just give it to you. So, so if you talk quickly about SWAN and what that is or how it's positioned within your product set. 
Yeah, okay, so SWAN is to help us achieve a full vertical. So like, as I mentioned, the note card is a more of a peripheral, like it's a data pump is what Ray calls it. I would say, if you think of this connection as a bridge, note card is the foot that's in hardware and note hub is our cloud and that's the foot in the cloud and this makes the bridge that you communicate over. Okay. Um, but SWAN is a microcontroller that used, it's an STM32 based microcontroller. And it's, we chose this one because it is a, it's capable of doing extraordinarily low power which is Ray's fascination, while it is still one of the strongest microcontrollers as far as computational ability and flexibility. And the fact that it's got like a CAN bus, MIPS controllers, uh, like two I2S lines, a bunch of weird peripherals, tons of I2Cs and SPIs. And so we have the swan that can be a feather, so it would look identical to this guy, this is a not a swan, but it's just what's in my hand. Uh, but it would look identical to this. Or you can, I'm gonna try to lift this other thing up. This is a little bit more of a lift here. Um, got, <laughs> I'm digging through like the garbage pile that's my desk right now. Hold on, there we go. Or you've got this board, which is our carrier board that comes with swan. The swan's got these castellated edges. It's a really cool concept. And what they did was they made it so you can solder it down to this bigger board. And then you get, instead of the, was it 34 pins? You get 64 pins available off of the STM microcontroller. So that's like, the, like not only is it like new, so it's super powerful and capable of doing low power. And it's an STM chip, which is like, you know, the Cadillac of microcontrollers. But also they did this castellated edge thing. So you get twice as many pins out of it if you solder it to this carrier board. And then you get access to just tons and tons of pins that are on the STM die. So if I'm just starting out, much like you were doing, you know, capturing temperature data as an example or salinity, et cetera, that's mm -hmm. a bit overkill then for me. Uh, uh well, yeah, yes and no. It, it can be used in either configuration, right? You could use it as the feather and then it's just right for what you're doing. Okay. But if you wanted it to grow and you didn't want to have to change your code or do anything different in your process, okay. then it can grow really easily into this much more pin dense configuration. Like I said, it comes this way too. Like it would come in like one of these guys where it's two rails, like just a, like one SPI, one I2C, uh, one TXRX and some analog and digital pins. So, so would that be the feather starter kit that I'm looking at here for Swan? Uh, yeah, but I think I just heard that that was on back order. Okay. So, um, but yes, it would be, or you, you can just, uh, I like that kit a lot. We've got, um, whenever, if, if, I don't I, I'm not looking at the website and I can't because I've got like this kind of display going on right now. Uh, but if it's sold out, you don't have to to buy the AF. I think the AF is what's sold out. I, I think the SWAN, we still have SWANs available. So yeah. you, you can buy that individually. And then you can buy, like I was telling him, the note carrier AL. Yeah. And the only difference is instead of seeding the SWAN in a, a preset socket, you just take four wires and connect it over and it's the same thing. So the swan with the note and the note carrier would get me in the game for what you're talking about today. Yes. Swan, cool. note card, and note carrier. That is correct. Yep, that's all that it takes. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yes. Are, are you folks going to sell the swan at Adafruit? Because the idea of them having a product, I mean, it being a feather, it's kind of natural, but the idea of having a product there that also supports um, Edge Impulse would be pretty cool. Yes, so we are working with Adafruit. We don't have anything finalized or finished. We're, we, we're in talks, uh, and that's the, that's the goal. So I can't say, yes, we're going to. We're talking. 
Uh, we also support CircuitPython, so we're a pretty compelling microcontroller. As that was far. actually my next question. <laughs> so, yeah, that's right. We just awesome. got, we were talking with like Lady Ada on our PR and she just blessed it. So it's getting merged. Like it may have got merged this morning. It's it's at that point though. Oh, so, okay, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, actually, uh, what's his name? Scott, who does the Friday deep dive. I've been going to that for several months, which you probably know about. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, so like I said, we're we're looking. Our eyes are pointed in that direction. That's the best. So I can do. you know, I mean, I know that's all you can say, but basically, what I'm hearing is be patient; it'll happen. <laughs> no, I can't say that. <laughs> yeah, no, but that that's my takeaway. <laughs> so. Well, fantastic. I think we may have hit the end of the questions. And Jack, Zach, I appreciate you sticking around. I, I've certainly learned a lot myself. We'll give one last call if there's a final question we need to address here, and else we'll turn you fine folks loose. The recording for this will be on YouTube in about an hour, hour and a half. I'll make sure it goes out to everyone who registered, just in case there's a part of this you want to revisit, like Zach's winning smile, for example. And, uh, you know, we do hope the discount code is useful to you. You know, we're not trying to make a buck off of you, but, you know, this is the best way to do it. So if there's a way we can be helpful, please let us know. So any final questions before we adjourn for today? All Marvelous. Right. Thank you, Zach. Thanks, guys. I appreciate you coming in. It was great talking with all you guys, and good luck on the hack. See you guys. Thank you very much. See you.